Hello and welcome. I'm Dr. Elena Filippo, a registered dietitian, providing information and helpful tips on diet and health. Did you know that if you accumulate fat around your waist, called visceral fat, you may be insulin resistant? Did you also know that the more fat you accumulate, the more insulin resistant you become, and that increases your risk of diabetes? So, if you suspect that you might have this condition, it would be good to consult your doctor in order to do the necessary blood tests. But before we start discussing insulin resistance and how diet can help, we need to first understand what is insulin and its role in the body. Insulin is a hormone produced by the beta cells of the pancreas. It is our main anabolic hormone, promoting storage and growth rather than breakdown which would be catabolic. Insulin's main role is the regulation of the metabolism of carbohydrates by promoting the uptake of glucose from the blood into the liver, fat and muscle cells. When glucose is absorbed into these cells, it is converted into molecules that can be stored, this being glycogen, which is a form of storage of carbohydrates, or fat. Insulin also affects protein synthesis another of its anabolic effects. When we eat something that contains carbohydrates, such as bread, pasta, rice, potato, fruit, sugar, or a favorite dessert, these carbohydrates are digested or broken down into the smaller molecules of glucose that can enter the blood. An increase in blood glucose causes the beta cells in the pancreas to secrete insulin which enhances glucose uptake and metabolism in the cells and thus reduces the glucose concentration in the blood. If blood glucose is low, insulin secretion is inhibited and glucagon, which was previously stored in the liver and the muscle cells, is now broken down to ensure that we have enough glucose in our blood. This regulation is called glucose homeostasis. When a person has insulin resistance, the cells of the muscles, fat and liver stop being as sensitive to insulin and they thus don't take in the glucose from the blood into the cells. This results in a rise in blood glucose concentration or hyperglycemia. When the beta cells of the pancreas sense this high blood glucose, they might release even more insulin, increasing its concentration in the blood and leading to hyperinsulinemia. The blood glucose concentration might then go down, but requiring a longer time and a higher concentration of insulin, which will also promote fat storage. Over time, a condition called prediabetes develops when there is a high glucose concentration even in the fasted state, and if this is left untreated, it can lead to type 2 diabetes. Here, I should say that diet and other lifestyle changes can improve both prediabetes and diabetes. How can you know if you have insulin resistance? There are no symptoms of insulin resistance, but from my experience, in addition to the accumulation of fat around the waist, many people complain about an unexplained need for sweet foods, especially after their meals. There is actually an explanation and a name for this, and it is called postpandrial hypoglycemia, which is a sudden drop in blood glucose after eating a big meal due to the excessive production of insulin in an effort to bring this glucose down. And the answer, of course, is not the consumption of more sweets, but the reduction of insulin resistance. Some people also have darkened skin in the armpit or on the back and sides of the neck. Insulin resistance can of course be tested by having a blood test of glucose and insulin or by consuming a known amount of glucose and checking the body's response to it. Consult your doctor for further advice on that. How can nutrition help? The best way to manage insulin resistance is weight loss combined with regular exercise. In actual fact, in the well-known diabetes prevention trial, People with high risk of developing diabetes were able to reduce their risk by losing 5% of their body weight and exercising. This effect, however, didn't last when they regained the weight, so it's especially important to make lifestyle changes and keep the weight off. Medications such as metformin may also be prescribed following medical consultation. 
But when it comes to the right type of foods, choosing low glycemic index or low GI carbohydrates is crucial. Consumption of a low GI diet improves insulin resistance and diabetes, and this is supported by many studies, including studies we conducted at the Hammersmith Hospital Imperial College London during my PhD. I think this is the reason that I love talking about GI so much. What is a food's glycemic index or GI? The GI ranks carbohydrates on a scale of 0 to 100 based on how quickly they increase blood glucose after eating. Foods with a high GI such as white bread are easily broken down and cause a quick increase in blood glucose, which might be followed by a sudden drop. In the opposite case, foods with a low GI such as seeded bread cause a slow release of glucose into the blood and blood glucose is maintained more steady for the next two hours without significant fluctuations. Low GI foods are those that have a GI of 55 or less on a scale of 100 and high GI foods are those having 70 or more on the same scale. As you can probably guess, a high increase in blood glucose, as in the case of high GI foods, means that there is also a high demand for insulin and indeed consumption of high GI foods is related to a higher risk of developing type 2 diabetes. On the contrary, Consumption of low GI foods is recommended for people with insulin resistance and diabetes and has been shown to reduce glucose concentration, improve diabetic control and glycated hemoglobin, but also improve cholesterol concentration and the risk of cardiovascular disease. Long-term randomized controlled trials have also shown that the low GI diet can reduce inflammation as shown by a reduction in CRP. On the contrary, research has shown that regular consumption of high GI foods, especially if these are also low in dietary fiber, can increase the risk of type 2 diabetes, heart disease, obesity, age-related macular degeneration, and some types of cancer. If you're interested to find out more about research evidence, you can consult the book I edited, The Glycemic Index, Applications in Practice, published by CRC Press. You can find the link to the book in the description below. Foods with a low GI include whole grain seeded bread, coarse oats, most legumes and especially lentils, belga wheat, quinoa, pasta cooked al dente, apples, oranges, berries and nuts. High GI foods include both white and brown bread, most breakfast cereals, baked and fried potatoes, jasmine rice, watermelon, dates and sugary drinks. Further information on specific food searches can be found on the University of Sydney's website, which can be seen above. If you want to reduce the glycemic index of your diet, you need to include a low GI food source with your meals and especially your breakfast, as studies have shown that there is a second meal effect. This phenomenon means that the GI of one meal can influence the glycemic response to the subsequent meal. For example, a low GI breakfast would lower the glycemic response to lunch and a low GI dinner would lower the glycemic response to the next day's breakfast. Another piece of advice would be that you don't need to avoid all high GI foods. You can still include them in your diet, but combine them with a low GI food. An example would be a baked potato which has a high GI combined with beans or nuts which have a low GI. Of course, there are occasions such as in athletes doing heavy aerobic exercise that foods with a high glycemic index can be beneficial and restore the glycogen broken down. It's important to also mention that the GI takes into account only the food's quality. If you want to take into consideration the quantity, which is of course also very important, we need to consider the glycemic load of each meal. Glycemic load, or GL, of a food is determined by multiplying its glycemic index by the amount of carbohydrates it contains. Generally, a glycemic load of 20 or greater is high, 11 to 19 is average, and 10 or less is low. Using GL, you can select low GI foods in the appropriate amount to avoid blood glucose and insulin fluctuations. 
So for example, you can consume a high GI food, but consume only a small amount in order to reduce the overall GL. So to put everything together, if you have insulin resistance, the most important steps to take is to lose weight, if this is necessary, exercise regularly and consistently following professional advice and choose low GI and GL foods in order to have a steady release of glucose into your system. From my experience, people that I advise on consumption of low GI or GL foods notice that they feel less hungry and don't have such an urgent need for sweet foods. This makes sense as the blood glucose fluctuations that they were experiencing before are now a thing of the past. A low GI weight loss diet also helps to reduce the accumulation of fat around the waist. As this visceral fat goes and insulin resistance drops, the person actually starts losing weight faster than before, since the anabolic defect of insulin is now reduced. So if you also have insulin resistance, start today to incorporate low GI foods with your meals and snacks and make your body more sensitive to insulin and see the benefits for yourself. Share this video with others who might be interested. Leave me a comment below on whether you have insulin resistance and what you do or did to overcome it. Bye for now and see you in the next video.